Okay, I think we can start. Uh, welcome everyone to this week's Autonomy Talk. This week is a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Zach Manchester, who is an assistant professor at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And he's also the founder of a Kicksat project. I, I didn't know about it, I Googled it today and uh, it seems very cool stuff. So something about uh, Zach, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Applied Physics and a PhD in Aerospace Engineering, both from Cornell. He then moved uh, to Harvard to work on his postdoc, and he, lately, and he also worked uh, at Stanford, at the NASA Ames Research Center, and at Analytical Graphics. So his research interests include motion planning, control, and numerical optimization. And in particular, he works on applications to robotic locomotion and spacecraft guidance, navigation, and control. For his research, he received the NASA Early Career Faculty Award in 2018, and he also has led three small satellite missions, which I find very cool. Um, today he's gonna talk about composable optimization for contact reach motion planning and control. This clearly falls in the scope of these uh, seminars and I'm very excited to hear more about it. So without further ado, Zach, uh, i give you the stage. All right, great. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me. And uh, it looks like we don't have a super huge crowd. Um, so I, I think this is good in the sense that uh, Please, uh, if you want to ask questions, I'd love to have some interaction. I think it's a small enough crowd that you guys can just unmute yourselves and and uh, speak up. So I, I would welcome that instead of just talking into the void on Zoom here. Uh, okay, with that, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a soft introduction. Uh, and being a space guy, uh, one of my favorite robots uh, is Mars Curiosity. And I think this is, you know, obviously one of the triumphs of... Uh, of robotics in the last couple of decades. And uh, in fact, this thing has been on Mars now for a decade, uh, which is amazing, right? That's something that we built and, and flew uh, there and landed in, in dramatic fashion has, is still functioning in such a harsh environment. Uh, so one thing I want to point out though, that sort of segues into what I'm going to talk about today is that uh, in 10 years, this robot has moved 28 kilometers. And that seems impressive until you divide those two numbers and see that that works out to be about 7.7 uh, .7 meters per day. And this number, seven or eight meters per day, is, is pretty consistent over the lifetime of this robot, um, what they've managed to, to cover in terms of uh, traveling across Mars. And I think um, there are a bunch of reasons for this, but a big one is that this robot is actually not very autonomous at all, uh, particularly with regard to its motion planning and control and, and its locomotion. There are lots of humans in the loop. And if you go visit JPL, they have this thing called the Mars Yard, right? It's a uh, basically a big sand pit with rocks. And they basically go in there and recreate the surroundings of the rover on Mars as closely as they can on Earth in this Mars Yard. And then a bunch of human engineers go and figure out, um, you know, by hand plan the moves that the robot's going to make around these rocks and such. And they go practice it a whole bunch in the Mars yard in the sand pit at JPL. And then they eventually, after practicing and rehearsing and, and you know testing a bunch of scenarios, they, they then uplink these commands and the robot drives. So there's this huge amount of human in the loop planning and control. It's a very high latency process with data coming back from Mars and engineers recreating the scene in the sand pit. And I'd argue that, um, if we had more onboard autonomy here and more, in particular, more ability for this robot to plan its own motion, uh, that we could travel a lot farther and in the end collect a lot more science data. Uh, and where I want to take this sort of thing is sort of show the baby steps that we've been taking in my lab towards this dream for the last, I would say, five, five years or so. Uh, so part one of the talk is I'm going to try to convince you that everything is optimization. And by everything, I mean in the uh, scope of this sort of uh, contact uh, dynamics, control, planning, et cetera, that there's a whole bunch of pieces of that problem and that all of the sub problems there, all of the little pieces are all in fact optimization problems, or at least can be thought of and posed as optimization problems. So the first one I think will come as no surprise to anyone here, control can be posed as optimization, right? And this classic optimal control stuff, uh, not to belabor it, you know, I know this audience is, is a little more sophisticated. So, uh, you know, you have a model of your system, uh, maybe in the form of your, you know, F equals MA style dynamics, and then maybe some constraints on your actuators, you know, torque limits, that sort of thing. You write down what you want it to do in the form of a cost function. And then in general, 
we can take this thing, discretize it somehow, lots of ways of doing that, right? Feed it to a computer and get some kind of answer. And you can do all kinds of cool things with this, like this perching airplane down here that I actually worked on as a postdoc, lots of other things. But, but you know, in principle, this is a very general and very powerful way of uh, planning and, and, and controlling motions for robots. So control. Next one is physics, actually. Uh, this is maybe less typical, uh, at least in the robotics and engineering communities, but has a long and deep history in physics, uh, actually, uh, it, that you can pose pretty much all of physics as optimization. So this is something called the least action principle or Hamilton's principle. And usually we see this in some kind of, you know, upper level undergraduate uh, dynamics course, you know, classical mechanics course. And then we use this to derive the euler lagrange equations, and then we forget about it and never think about it again. But the idea is uh, you can write down this function here called the action. And the L in here is the Lagrangian, the classic, you know, uh, kinetic minus potential energy. These Qs, uh, this is the, the robot pose trajectory, and then the Q dot would be the velocities. L is the Lagrangian. So uh, Hamilton's principle, or the least action principle, says that the true trajectory Q of t that the system or the robot in this case follows is the one that minimizes this action integral over here. Um, and we know how to compute the Lagrangian, everyone's familiar with that. And it turns out if you kind of analytically set the gradient of this equal to zero, the result is the Euler Lagrange equations, AKA the manipulator equation, if you like, in robotics. Um, and that's usually what we're, where we leave it. Uh, but it turns out there's a lot to be gained from actually looking at this as an optimization problem. Uh, from this perspective. So in particular, if I take this problem and I discretize it, just like I would say an optimal control problem, I can actually directly minimize this thing numerically and get physics out. Uh, this idea is is not, it's it's surprisingly recent, but not that new. It's, it dates back to the early 2000s and uh, has, is called discrete mechanics. This was Jerry Marsden and a bunch of his students uh, from Caltech. Uh, that did this. And there's there's a lot of really interesting theory here, and it's, it's very deep and powerful and interesting. Uh, just briefly mention that one of the cool things that come out of, of, of this set of ideas is that if you set up uh, your physics, uh, you get all these really cool properties like momentum and energy conservation, symmetry, preservation, things that, that show up in the continuous equations of motion uh, in the physics are preserved by this style of discretization, which is super cool. Kind of not the main point here, but so why do we care about this? Well, um, if you kind of uh, treat it this way and solve it as a numerical optimization problem, then this opens you up uh, some interesting new possibilities. In particular, you can now think about adding constraints to this, right? We can solve constrained optimization problems. We do it all the time. And one that's highly relevant to what we're talking about right now is I can do uh, the following thing. I can put uh, a constraint that looks like this, which we'll call a sign distance function. Um, this is basically saying that the distance between objects has to stay uh, non-negative. So that it's really, what this is saying is that we can't have interpenetration between objects. So a cartoon here, if you think about uh, a falling brick, and this is just the, the height of the brick, so say the Z coordinate, um, this is saying that the brick is not allowed to go through the floor. It turns out that if I go ahead and set this up as a standard constrained optimization problem, turn the crank, solve this however you want numerically, what comes out of this is uh, that um, uh, impacts basically pop out for free. And sort of unsurprisingly, the, the Lagrange multipliers of this constraint end up being the impact forces or the normal forces, all, all this kind of good stuff happens. Um, and now we have a way of, of nicely simulating uh, a bunch of non-smooth kind of impact interactions. Okay, so that's impacts and kind of standard F equals MA type physics as optimization. Uh, another one that I'm guessing a lot of us are familiar with in, in robotics is Coulomb friction. Uh, so you can, uh, why might you want to do this? Well, if you haven't thought about it much, it turns out Coulomb friction is non-smooth and, and sort of annoying to deal with. Um, but if you write it this way, it's, it, it turns out to be quite nice. So what this says, uh, this is called the maximum dissipation principle. And it says that the uh, force due to Coulomb friction, which is the B over here, is the one that instantaneously sucks out the most 
kinetic energy from the system. So this is the rate of change of, of the energy of the system. And we're minimizing it over the friction force. So it's saying that friction is the, you know, the, the solution to this problem is, is uh, Coulomb friction is the one that sucks out the most kinetic energy subject to this constraint that's called the friction cone. And what this says is that this friction force, the tangential force, has to be less than or equal to some friction coefficient mu times the normal force lambda. And if you think about this geometrically, um, this constraint is a cone. And what's going on here is uh, if B is inside the interior of the cone, um, this means that I've, I've got uh, that the, the object stationary and I have sticking friction. And um, what happens as I say push harder, push harder, push harder, uh, and this friction force is countering my pushing force, eventually it'll reach the boundary of the cone and there's no more friction to be had. And at that point, if we push a little bit harder, uh, we get slipping. And that's when you've hit the boundary of the cone and now things start to slide, right? So that stick slip transition is captured by being in the interior or on the boundary of this friction cone constraint. And it, this can handle very nicely this stick slip stuff. Okay, so friction is optimization. The last one, which is actually the one we've been working on the most in my group recently, is collision detection and, and geometry and this kind of stuff uh, as optimization. So this one also, if you think about it, isn't super surprising. But if, if you're familiar with how this works right now in most physics engines uh, used in, say, Bullet, Mujoko, these sorts of things, the, the classic way of doing this, uh, mostly from computer graphics, is uh, with a set of algorithms called GJK or enhanced GJK. And essentially what they do is look at convex polytopes. And they kind of traverse the edges of these polytopes in, in kind of a search kind of way uh, to find the closest points between objects. And then they kind of compute the distances between the closest points. This is, by the way, to get that sign distance function that we talked about, right? So another way to go that we've been playing around with is um, at least for convex shapes, this is sort of unsurprisingly a convex optimization problem. You basically say, you know, minimize the distance between two points, and then you have convex constraints that each of those two points has to be inside these convex shapes, and you have a convex optimization problem, right? Um, and we can do this for, you know, kind of any convex primitive you like, so spheres, polytopes, uh, capsules, cylinders, cones, ellipsoids, if you like, and uh, essentially just solve that optimization problem. And this is kind of showing you that happening. In particular, uh, you know, this handles smooth shapes, unlike uh, the GJK stuff that, that needs to deal with uh, discrete or discretized mesh kind of polytope things. And um, it can handle, like, you'll, you'll notice, right, the, the point on the cone here, uh, these kind of edge things that look, you know, kind of like they might be non-differentiable and nasty handles very well. And this is showing just kind of the red dots at the closest points. And uh, you'll see sort of the, the collision interactions uh, kind of nicely simulated here. OK, so this is kind of arguing that from collision geometry to physics, basic physics to friction to all the way to control, all the pieces that we need to be able to attack uh, these sort of contact uh, motion planning and control problems in robotics uh, can be posed as optimization problems very cleanly. Uh, so now on to part two. Hopefully I've, I've convinced you guys of, of this idea of everything pretty much as optimization. So then the question becomes, if I can pose all these subproblems as optimization problems, how ultimately do I solve, uh, say, a, an optimal control problem? Uh, how do I put all these pieces together, right? Each one of these blocks is a separate optimization problem that maybe I, I have a nice solver for. But um, naively, you know, I, I can't expect to take the solution out of one of these and plug it into another and have these guys depend on each other and, and have any hope of this working, right? So the question now is how do I compose these different optimization problems? How do I connect them? How do I hook them together? And how do I solve them jointly to, to generate robot behaviors and controllers and this sort of thing? So um, as a sort of, entry point into this, um, let's just talk a bit about kind of historically how people have dealt with contact stuff in this context and kind of an optimal control context and why it's tricky. So this is back to the sort of optimal control problem that we started with when we kind of argued that control is optimization. The big problem here with contact stuff like this, uh, like a robot down here is that 
the dynamics, well, and all of the constraints, right, in your in your optimization problem, using conventional optimization tools, uh, we have to assume some degree of smoothness in these constraint functions. And dynamics end up being constraint functions here. So if you have impacts and friction, which are non-smooth, this causes a lot of problems. And numerical optimization tools that rely on gradient information really struggle here and have a lot of problems. So how do we deal with this now? What are most people doing? I would say the most of the stuff you see, uh, the you know MIT cheetah stuff, uh, animal from from ETH there, and and all the Boston Dynamics stuff. Pretty sure, though they don't talk about it too much. Um, most of the impressive things you're seeing on legged robots right now uh, use what's called a hybrid approach. So the idea here is that if we can pre-specify the contacts when they happen and when they transition. So for a legged robot, this is the time steps at which the feet touch down and lift off. And so when they're in contact with the ground, when they're not, this sort of thing, if we can pre-specify that a priori, we can basically remove the nasty non-smooth contact stuff from the optimization problem and only really optimize over the smooth arcs between what are called mode switches between these contact switches. So the, the advantage here is now we're basically back to solving a smooth optimization problem that we know how to deal with. So we can get nice solutions quickly, uh, everything works. The, the problem is we have to do this pre-specification of these contact modes of these footstep transitions, say. And uh, this, is, this has been done for, for quadrupeds in particular very successfully. Essentially what happens there, if you kind of look at these videos, you can tell what that this is going on if you know a little bit of, of how these things work under the hood. Essentially you assume a gate, like a trot or something like this. And uh, though the footstep timing is just totally open loop pre-specified by this say trotting gate pattern and that gets fed into the controller. Uh, you can do this for something like a quadruped, right? You've got trot, walk, canter, this kind of thing. You can have some gate heuristics that you can use or choose between in various ways. Um, but for really kind of contact rich stuff, so say uh, in-hand manipulation, uh, things like this where uh, you have a lot of possible contact points, maybe even a continuum of possible contacts, an infinite number of possible contacts, it can be really hard to pre-specify these things and come up with good heuristics, right? And so we'd really like the optimizer to be able to reason over the space of contacts and the timing of the contacts and all this kind of stuff for us. Uh, so there, there's a lot of work on that going back about almost 10 years now uh, on what's called contact implicit uh, optimization. And the idea here is you wanna put everything in the optimizer. So you wanna optimize over the states, the controls, and the contact forces as decision variables. Um, and this can do all the things, right? This can generate the gates for you, these complex contact sequences kind of automatically. The problem is due to the non-smoothness we just talked about, uh, these tend to be very inaccurate. They rely on a bunch of smoothing tricks and heuristics uh, to, to sort of smooth out a bunch of these nasty things so you can get gradients so that optimizers work. And in general, they suffer from severe numerical difficulties, lots of ill conditioning, lots of bad local optima, this kind of stuff. Uh, so they just don't work that well. And that's why kind of no one does it. And, and all the successful stuff you've seen is pretty much this, this hybrid approach. Uh, okay, so how are we gonna fix this? Uh, what are we doing here? Um, so we're gonna kind of go, uh, go at this from this perspective of what I've started calling composable optimization. And the idea is, Rather than kind of try to smush this stuff all together and uh, uh, smooth it out or whatever, we're actually going to treat each of these problems as a as an optimization problem in its own right. Write a custom solver for that particular problem that works well, and then we're going to differentiate through the solver. So we'll have a say a Coulomb friction solver. We're going to solve that Coulomb friction problem. We're going to differentiate its solution, and we're going to then uh, pass that to, say, the impact dynamics problem, the control problem, et cetera. So we're going to connect multiple solvers uh, and rely on some, some recent ideas from differentiable optimization to put these pieces together. Uh, so I'll explain some of how that works, and then we'll show some, some results. So the key idea here that, that we're leveraging, um, which is you know, inspired by some work from the, the differentiable optimization kind of community, um, 
a lot of people in machine learning have, have been thinking about these kind of things, but takes a bit of a different tack with some maybe some more classical ideas. We, we've kind of stumbled on this approach uh, of what we call uh, differentiable interior point methods. So um, as a quick overview, there's a very rich topic area with like 30 years of, of really deep work. But basically, if I have an optimization problem that looks like this, minimize some f subject to some constraint c. In particular, we're going to look at inequality constraints here. So c is greater than or equal to 0. Uh, the, the interior point trick uh, or the log barrier trick is to take this problem and to stuff the inequality constraint into the objective with this log barrier term. So we pretty much just stuff the constraint function into a log. The log blows up as you approach zero. And we're going to stick this uh, one over rho kind of fudge factor on here that's called the barrier parameter or sometimes the central path parameter. Uh, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But now we've, we basically have an equivalent problem in the limit as rho goes to uh, to infinity, right? Yeah, rho gets big. No, I did that wrong. In the limit as rho goes to zero, this guy approaches the original problem. Uh, so here's here's the plot of that, right? So this is showing this log barrier term. And as you can see, kind of as I crank down the row, this log barrier kind of approaches this, this brick wall uh, function and uh, interior point methods. OK, so uh, there's a lot more to this, say about this. Uh, this is a very sort of naive kind of, you know, uh, first order picture of how these things work. There's a lot more details under the hood that I'm glossing over, like uh, the primal dual methods for solving these, which we use, and also some very sophisticated line search predictor corrector stuff, which we're also doing. But uh, those are, I would argue, those are details. So the important thing here is now we can shove our inequality constraints into this kind of smooth objective. The, the key here is smooth. So this log thing is differentiable. I can apply Newton's method to this. There's lots and lots of work on, you know, Newton's method applied to primal dual interior point methods and fast convergence rates and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and now what I can do, now that it looks like this, I can actually take a solution to this problem with the log barrier in it. And I can use the implicit function theorem, which is this guy down here, and I can differentiate it with respect to you know, pretty much anything I want. So in particular, the way we've posed this one here is we've got an x, which is the, the decision variable. So this is like the things we're actually optimizing over. And we've got a theta, which is some parameter vector. We call it the problem data. Um, that isn't what we're optimizing over. And we can solve this problem with respect to x. We can then extract the derivative partial x, partial theta at the solution. Um, so the way to think about the x and the theta here, so let's say we're thinking about the Coulomb friction problem, right? And that Coulomb friction problem is a function of the, say, robot pose and velocity, but we're optimizing over the friction force, right? So the pose and velocity might be in your theta and the friction force of the x. Then if we think about that impact dynamics problem, that's got all your f equals ma stuff. Um, the friction force is, is an input there, but it's not a decision variable, right? So in that problem, the, the friction force would be in the theta and the uh, pose and velocity would be in the x, right? And so we can kind of hook these things together. The key idea is now that I've done it, uh, now that I've got this kind of differentiable optimization machinery, I can solve each of these sub problems. So the friction problem, the impact problem, the collision detection, collision geometry problem, I can solve them all with these little interior point solvers. And I can compute these derivatives of the uh, the decision variables with respect to the problem data. So like friction force with respect to robot pose. And now I can treat this whole solver as a function x of theta, where x of theta is the, is the optimum. And I can get this first derivative, usually a Jacobian matrix, partial x, partial theta. So now I can treat this entire optimization problem, so this, this whole block in that web, as just a function x of theta that's differentiable. I can get dx d theta. And that's all I need for, uh, for Newton style optimization. I can now take this thing and use it as a constraint or an objective term in, in any of the other problems. And this is kind of the key idea for wiring these all together. All right, differentiable interior point methods. Um, there's some details here. In particular, there's, there's a lot of details on that, that fudge factor row, the, the barrier parameter that we can get into. Um, 
but I'll skip that for now. Okay, so what are we doing with this? So the first thing that I'll talk about is uh, if we take the sort of bottom half of that triangle thing, uh, diagram, we, uh, if we take the collision stuff, the Coulomb friction stuff and the impact dynamic stuff, and we kind of treat all those in this way, uh, we can build a simulator and we've done that. Uh, we call it Dojo and there's some early versions of this online now. This is showing uh, you know, dropping uh, Atlas on the floor with no torque supplied, just passive physics kind of slowed down. Um, so uh, this does right now, rigid body dynamics, multi-body dynamics with contact. Uh, has some interesting properties versus some other simulators like that are that are more standard and robotics like Mujoko and, and Bullet, um, Dart. Uh, it works quite differently from all those. In particular, uh, we get hard contact simulation, so we we get convergence to you know true hard contact answers uh, with no. And what I mean by that, it really is that there is no interpenetration or creep artifacts, and this is. Uh, emphatically not the case with most of the other simulators out there right now. Um, in particular, Mujoko, that's, that's very popular in the, the reinforcement learning community, suffers from large amounts of, of the, both of these things. So if you have like an object on an inclined plane, it always creeps, it always slides a little bit because you don't get that hard stick slip Coulomb friction stuff. And you get lots of interpenetration where if you were to say drop this robot on the ground like this, the feet would sink into the ground a bunch because there's all kinds of approximate smoothing stuff going on. Um, and I mentioned before the discrete mechanics stuff, uh, the way we're doing the physics, you get energy and momentum conservation, or at least you know very good energy and momentum properties over, over very long simulation horizons. Basically get that for free by handling the physics that way. And the last one is that um, we are using this sort of primal dual, differentiable primal dual interior point thing that I just talked about to get smooth gradients for doing optimization on top of this simulator. Uh, and uh, you would think that this hard contact idea, getting hard contact with no artifacts and this smooth gradient idea are at odds, right? This seems like you can't have both. I'm gonna sort of argue that you can have both. And what we're doing here, this is kind of some cartoony pictures of, of these things. So the black line here is the hard contact solution. This is for uh, impact forces on a brick falling and this is friction, Coulomb friction with stick slip sliding. So the black line is the true solution, right? This hard contact solution. That's when we solve that primal dual interior point thing all the way to convergence with rho getting cranked all the way down. Um, but what we're doing here, practically speaking, is we're gonna, in the simulator, we're gonna solve that to convergence, get the hard contact solution, but then we're gonna back off a little bit on that barrier parameter row. So when we, as we converge, right, we're, we're following this, what's called the central path and optimization, we're cranking row down and, and solving uh, as we go. We can actually just back up a little bit to a, uh, a, a step or two before we converged fully where rho is a little bit relaxed and where all these things are smoothed out a little bit. And we can use those gradients. So we can have the hard contact solution to the physics problem, but back up uh, a tiny bit in the solver, like rewind the solver a tiny bit and get the gradients from just before that. Uh, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. This, these are showing both the impact force and friction force uh, Jacobians. Um, as a function of that, that central path parameter row and showing that you can get uh, kind of any degree of smoothness you like. And I'd say there's still a bunch of stuff to play around with here. Um, there's still some, some complicated stuff here. And I think there's still a lot of theory to do here and exactly how these things are all connected together and how to uh, like best crank on these parameters, especially when we're combining four or five of these things all at the same time and each has its own rows. Um, but the, the idea is you can have your cake and eat it too. You can get smooth gradients and the hard contact uh, on, on these physics. So uh, what are we doing with this? So here's just some, some kind of cartoony examples that we've put together uh, in Dojo. The first one, this is a little like Raybert style hopper uh, where we've optimized this with, with trajectory optimization using the simulator gradients. Uh, this one, uh, this falling box thing, which you're seeing there is actually um, least squares regression on the uh, geometry mass properties and friction coefficient on a uh, throwing a box on the ground. Uh, so this is taken from a real data set where we're trying to match up the simulator. So trying to do real to sim, right? Where we uh, regress the, 
model parameters in the simulator uh, based on real data. And you can see we get sort of reasonable agreement. And then the bottom thing here, this is, uh, these are a couple of examples from the, the sort of, I don't know, ubiquitous uh, OpenAI gym set of examples where we've got the half cheetah and this weird little four-legged guy uh, where we're using kind of pretty standard reinforcement learning techniques. Um, in all, in, uh, there's a lot more to say about the reinforcement learning examples. In particular, we're not using any of the fancy RL algorithms. Uh, instead, we're just doing very vanilla uh, gradient descent using real gradients out of the simulator. And it turns out it's way more data efficient than these sort of purely sample-based model-free techniques that are they're standard there. And we can get you know, state-of-the-art results really in like an order of magnitude, fewer samples or whatever. Um, okay, so that's uh, the simulation stuff. Uh, switching gears a little bit more, uh, which is what I've already hinted here on top of this, uh, doing trajectory optimization. So now this is putting together the entire picture that I showed at the beginning, where we've got at the bottom here, we've got our geometry collision detection stuff. That's a solver. We've got Coulomb friction. That's a solver. We've got the impact dynamics. That's a solver. And up at the top here, we've got that optimal control problem that we talked about at the very beginning. And that's a solver. And these guys are all connected. I'll, I'll, like these blue arrows show where sort of the problem data from one is, is buried in a constraint function and the other and vice versa. All these are using these interior point tricks. And essentially what we're doing to get this whole thing to work is we're combining uh, the, we're, we're basically cranking down on those central path parameters for all of these solvers kind of in unison. So we start with everything really smoothed out and then we crank them together so that as the whole stack converges, we're, we're converging towards hard, hard contact solutions uh, on the whole thing altogether. And that that's sort of the secret sauce that makes it work. Uh, here's a couple of cartoony examples. This one's actually really old. This one's more recent uh, on a Unitry A1 robot that we've got in the lab. Um, so, so we can do offline planning with this. Um, I'm going to show you the, the really fun stuff now. So this stuff is, uh, you know, works, but is not particularly fast. This is like minutes for this kind of stuff offline uh, on a workstation. Uh, so we can generate these things. The thing that's always really bothered me about this stuff is, is, you know, we've been doing this for a while. We can generate these plans offline, but we had no good way of tracking these sort of arbitrary um, multi-contact things in an online setting. And as someone who's maybe a little too obsessed with doing optimization, I, I always wanted something that was sort of um, the sort of contact aware equivalent of like a linear MPC. It's like, how can I take, you know, this QP based MPC stuff that's, that works so well, right? That's in fact, how all these state-of-the-art robots work now. How can I sort of have something like that that can reason about contact? Uh, that we can solve quickly online. So that was kind of what I was after. And I'll show you where we're at with this right now. This is all very fresh, uh, this summer stuff that's not quite out there yet in the wild. Um, so bear with me a bit. The next slide is ugly, but you don't have to parse this. This is basically the whole stack of all of this stuff uh, in this diagram put together that we're solving. And it's very messy. And what we want to do here is, is see where we can strategically simplify things and approximate things, and in particular, linearize things. I can't linearize the whole thing, right? Because I want to maintain this reasoning about contact, non-smooth stuff. But can I read? Can I can I go in and linearize a bunch of the pieces inside? And it turns out you can. So here's what we're going to do. First thing, unsurprisingly, is we're going to go linearize the robot dynamics. So we're going to go linearize like the F equals MA stuff, right? The the robots. Uh, the, all the stuff that, that that's about the robot uh, kinematics and dynamics, right? Um, not including the contact forces. And we're going to do that about some reference trajectory, say, right? If we're going to try to track a reference. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is, oh, sorry for the slide weirdness. We're then also going to go in and linearize the contact manifold. So when I say contact manifold, I mean that sign distance function, phi, that tells me how close I am to the floor. Uh, keep in mind that's phi of q, so it's if you're using joint angles, it's a function of the joint angles, which is a really gnarly nonlinear function, then, right? So it's basically got forward kinematics inside, and that's a very messy thing. Okay, so we're that's a complicated nonlinear function. We're going to go ahead and linearize that function also about a reference trajectory. The last one we're going to do is we're also going to linearize that friction cone constraint again about a reference. So we're going to take basically all of the subproblems in that big diagram I showed you, and we're going to linearize 
all the pieces inside each of those sub problems while keeping though the overall optimization problem structure, right? So each one of those is still an optimization problem, but now it's an easier optimization problem, right? So each one of those is now basically like an LP or a QP instead of a nasty non-convex problem. But we're keeping the overall structure. We're keeping all of the uh, all of that stuff that allows us to reason about contact. So we've simplified a whole bunch of that stuff way down and made those problems a lot easier. Albeit now what we've given up, right, is we're, we're linearizing a bunch of these things or approximating them in the neighborhood of some reference trajectory. So uh, i.e. we're doing tracking now online, whereas we optimize those gates or reference motions offline. The other trick, this is getting really in the weeds. So we, we do lots of low level numerical optimization stuff in my group. Um, so for those who are into that, here you go. Uh, if you're not, if this is too, too much for you, it turns out, most of us, you know, we we like we use backslash, you know, in in MATLAB or Julia or, or Python or whatever all the time to solve our linear solve a x equals b. Turns out that's a very complicated beast under the hood, uh, and and there's a lot more going on uh, than than you might ever want to know. Uh, but um, there's uh, so so uh, I'll just mention briefly the other big trick we're playing here to get this stuff to go fast. There's a lot of numerical linear opti like uh, linear algebra tricks under the hood that make this work. This is a big one. So uh, each of those optimization problems, you end up solving a linear system, you know, in in the loop in the optimizer. It has a bunch of structure. Uh, there's a bunch of block structure in there, a bunch of sparsity structure associated with this this primal dual interior point thing. Uh, we do some tricks to sort of symmetrize and condense that into a slightly smaller linear system. And then the the big trick here uh, that I'm kind of glossing over is it turns out we did all these linearizations about a reference that I mentioned. Uh, if we're doing online tracking uh, about a reference that was pre-computed offline, we know a lot of stuff ahead of time, right? So we've, we've designed this reference trajectory offline. We can also compute all these linearizations, all these derivatives about that reference trajectory ahead of time offline. And that's most of what's in this big linear system. Most of it is like the Jacobians and Hessians of things that I know ahead of time. There's a few parts of this that do change online, but a lot of the matrix is fixed ahead of time. So what we do is something called a partial QR factorization. So the gist of this is with a QR factor, if, if you know how these things work under the hood, most of the QR, LU, et cetera, they all kind of work, uh, the, the simple ones work very similarly in that they start say in the top left corner of the matrix and they go, they work their way right across the matrix as they factorize. So in QR, you'll start at kind of the, the left column and you'll work your way over as you triangularize the, the R factor. And what we can do is permute this matrix ahead of time where we take all the stuff we pre-compute that we know ahead of time. So all those Jacobians about the reference, et cetera. And we can permute this matrix to stuff all of the stuff that's known uh, ahead of time on the left side of the matrix. And then all the stuff that's changing online, we push to the right. And then ahead of time, we go ahead and we start the QR factorization offline ahead of time. We partially, we do QR all the way across the matrix, covering all the stuff that we know ahead of time until we get to the stuff that we only know at runtime. And so we, and we cache those partial factorizations. So now at runtime, all we have to do is take the current state, take the stuff we couldn't, we didn't know ahead of time and just finish it off. So we're saving a huge amount of compute online. Turns out this trick uh, is a 15x speed up over sort of naively factorizing the whole matrix using kind of standard backslash stuff. Uh, so between the linearizing tricks and these sort of ahead of time pre-computing partial factorization tricks, we get a couple of orders of magnitude speed up on the that trajectory optimization stuff I showed you before. And we go from like minutes to now being able to run stuff at like 50 to 100 hertz. Uh, so what have we done with this? Uh, I'll show you some some cute sim simulation demos first. So this one we call pushbot. This is an inverted pendulum that has sort of like an arm pusher arm at the top, so that it can push against these two walls. And we're giving it random perturbations uh, with these sort of. Uh, we're basically punching it right, and uh, whoops, and it's got to push against the walls to balance. And this problem is uh, we've linearized the pendulum about that upright equilibrium. Uh, it's got a sign distance function in there uh, that's also linearized, right? Um, and all it, uh, we, we give it no a priori contact information. So all of this reasoning about pushing against the wall stuff that it can reach out and push, touch the wall and get, get forced that way, that's all done online in the loop. 
uh, here. None of that stuff is pre-computed. And this is all just, it's it's getting perturbed online. It doesn't know anything about that ahead of time. So uh, this is kind of showing that the, this whole setup is able to reason about new contact modes and about making and breaking contact with the environment uh, online at real time rates. This one's pretty fun. Uh, this is just a cool animation that one of my students, uh, Simon, put together. Uh, this is us running uh, this MPC thing in real time on a um, planar quadruped robot. Uh, what this is showing is just a bunch of random initial conditions where we drop it you know, from a ton of random, uh, random seeds and then run this uh, tracking controller, this MPC tracking controller on a simple walk-in gate. And as you can see, there's all kinds of different contact mode stuff happening. Uh, but all of these random feeds converge to this nice periodic walking gate pretty quickly. So again, like uh, different contact modes happening, um, but but like a, a fairly robust convergence behavior. Uh, let's see. These are a handful of other kind of cartoony examples showing that this is pretty robust to model mismatch. So the top one is that planar quadruped again, but with a uh, an extra like 10 or 20 kilograms strapped to its back that wasn't modeled and wasn't in the reference, you know, offline reference design. The bottom two, these are, uh, this is actually a, a model of a pretty classic uh, biped from about 20 years ago called Spring Flamingo. Um, that's an underactuated biped walking. And so this, this one is showing you that uh, we designed, you know, the, uh, an offline walking reference on flat ground. And then online, we run it with this MPC controller and give it varying terrain and it's able to work still on, on these. So it's, it's able to handle model mismatch disturbances, et cetera. Uh, this one is, is the last simulation one I'll show you that I think is particularly cool. So this is us essentially shoving the quadruped uh, and showing it doing kind of a pretty impressive push recovery. Uh, what you're seeing here is a model we are using for the full 3D quadruped that's a bit simplified for computational reasons. Uh, so it's a single rigid body for the body and then point masses for the feet. So we're essentially ignoring uh, the details of the joint kinematics in the legs and then doing like uh, a uh, sort of inverse dynamics, inverse kinematics stuff to, to back out the joint angles and joint torques given the foot forces here. Um, so what this is showing you though is if I kind of really give this thing a push, it's flying through the air. Um, this thing is right now, the reference here is just this nominal trotting gate that you see it, it converged to at the end. Uh, so that's the reference, stand in place and trot. It gets this giant shove uh, from the equilibrium position over here. And this controller is reasoning about you know, really complicated making and breaking contact, moving the feet to, uh, to recover so it doesn't fall over, and then actually trotting back to the equilibrium pose a couple of meters uh, away where it started. All of this is, is linearized about a single equilibrium point with this, this, this trotting gate. So this kind of you know, approximated uh, stuff, the, the approximations hold up quite well, I would say is, is what this is telling us. Okay, so lots of simulation. I will now uh, show you the real stuff. Um, I will caveat this with all of this is extremely fresh. Uh, this is stuff that uh, just kind of has come together in the last few weeks, uh, the hardware experience I'm going to show you. Um, so this is uh, a Unitree A1 robot. So these are kind of a, a low cost quadruped from China. We, we now have three of them in the lab. And this is us running this contact implicit stuff on, this one is just simple walking with the uh, obligatory kick the robot kind of stuff. Uh, I would say, you know, we're nowhere near as robust or performant as the more traditional MPC approaches right now, uh, as, as say Cheetah or, or Spot or Animal. Uh, those are all doing kind of hybrid style MPC. Um, but you know, for a first cut, uh, we're, we're getting there. Uh, and we can actually solve those, those really kind of complicated optimization problems at, at real time rates. I think that's the main takeaway. Uh, I would say this isn't particularly exciting, right? Saying that we can trot not, not exciting with this stuff. That's kind of not the point. The, this maybe slightly more exciting stuff is uh, this is getting at it. Um, we can take an arbitrary reference trajectory, right? At least one that's like more or less dynamically feasible that you design offline for one of these things. 
And then you can just feed it to this controller and track it. So what you're seeing here is uh, offline, we designed a, a motion for this robot that started from kind of a seated position, stands up, takes a step, then puts one foot up on this box, the other foot up on the box. And where we're going with is we're gonna to try to get the robot to kind of scramble its way up and climb up on the box and do some other kind of weird things that are not periodic walking gate type motions, which is what the hybrid controllers, the current state of the art hybrid controllers are very good at. We're not as good at, at that right now, but we can do this sort of thing where we take just some arbitrary motion, just throw it in the MPC controller and it can track it, right? So uh, more to come on this. We're working on some, some more things along these lines where we're trying to do things that are not periodic walking gates, right? Um, some funky locomotion tasks and, and some manipulation tasks as well. Uh, this guy is hopefully going to climb up on that box. The other thing I'll mention too is we can quite easily reason about contacts with other parts of the body here. So rather than just the point feet, we can handle you know the elbows and the arm, forearms or whatever, this kind of thing, and then much more rich contact with the environment with these kind of tools. Uh, with that, I will uh, plug my really amazing students who've done uh, all of this work. So um, Taylor Howell and Simon Lecliche, uh, uh, Lecliche, uh, I always get that wrong. Um, these guys are the main drivers behind uh, the dojo simulation stuff and a whole lot of the differentiable interior point machinery you saw. Brian Jackson is uh, a sort of all around numerical optimization guru in the lab who is very good at writing fast code and, and makes a lot of that stuff work. Kevin Tracy has been the main driver of the uh, this recent collision detection, collision geometry work that I kind of teased that's uh, still in work. And then uh, Shuo is a, a PhD student in, in RI here that's uh, focusing on state estimation for the legged robots, but he's been one of the main guys getting our hardware stack uh, up and running. And then Chien, who actually just defended and graduated with his master's last week, he's off to industry now, unfortunately, he has been, uh, actually is the one who got all those hardware experiments working. Uh, so these guys are great. And I'd love to chat with you guys and, and interact hopefully a little bit more. If you wanna get a hold of me though for, uh, offline conversations. Uh, that's uh, my email, the GitHub where all this stuff is, and uh, the lab website. Thank you, Zach, for the great talk. Uh, let's open the stage for questions. You can either unmute yourself and ask, or post them in the chat, and I will uh, I will repeat them for you. So, is there any question? Go ahead, Dennis. Do you have a question? Yeah, I can. Uh, I have a few, so I mean, I, I guess I'll uh, I'll kick it off. Um, so I guess my first question is: so with the difference of like interior point methods, I I see like you have to invert like partial R, partial X. Like, do you usually run into issues when you have to invert this, or is this pretty like what? okay? Yeah, this is what we're talking about. So um, I glossed over a lot of details in here. What that is, that R thing, that's the KKT residual for this uh, optimization problem. So write down the KKT conditions for my, my thing. Uh, the log barrier tricks kind of relax those, right? So I can use Newton's method on them. And then what I'm actually doing when I solve the, the optimization problem is I'm solving R equals zero, where R is the KKP residual, right? I'm solving like a root binding problem on R equals zero. So it turns out partial R, partial X, and partial R, well, partial R, partial X, that's basically the KKT matrix that I've got in my interior point solver. So it's something I'm already computing. And that 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 inverse is essentially, I, we don't really invert it, right? What, what's actually in there is like a, a factorization, like an LDL transpose factorization typically. It's the sort of thing that you're, so I guess that the, the punchline is that inverse, that that thing in there is actually something I'm already having to compute to solve the optimization problem to begin with. So that's actually in the guts of the interior point solver already. So actually most of that, that computation is free. That partial R partial X inverse thing is basically free because I have to do it already to solve the optimization problem to begin with. So the only new stuff I have to compute is really that partial R partial theta Jacobian on the right hand side to get these derivatives out of this differentiable interior point method. Oh, no, that definitely makes sense. Um, okay, so for as for the um, the physics of optimization, so I don't necessarily know. I'm convinced if this is like 
a strict minimization because to me it kind of, at least in my brain, is more of a saddle. So can you elaborate a little bit more on this? Yeah. So this just this sort of very very classical like least action Hamilton's principle thing, without yes. the yeah. So this thing, technically speaking, is it's called stationary action, right? Sometimes. So it turns out there's some more details in here. It can absolutely be a saddle, like you're saying. Um, there are those some technical details that that basically say it's it's usually a minimum. And in fact, it doesn't really matter. Like uh, the way we're solving this, it, it sort of doesn't matter. But to, to just be extra, I guess, uh, pedantic about it, yeah, technically this thing can give you a, a saddle. But if the if the time horizon here, if the basically if the the time window between t naught and t final is small, then it's a minimum. It's a strict minimum, and that's typically how we use it actually. So what we're really doing here is we're really only doing this over like a single time step of the simulator. So as long as like TF is, you know, pretty close to T naught, it's always a strict minimizer. And there's some more technical stuff in there, but but that's like essentially the gist of it. So so in practice, the way we're doing it, it, it is always a strict minimizer. Oh, well, that definitely makes sense. Uh, and my last question is, um, so I guess, I'm just kind of curious, like how would these ideas, oh, well, I don't know if you guys have started thinking about it, but I guess how would these ideas that you've been talking about, like how how would they work with like a surface that may be, or if you're in contact with something that may be like deformable a little bit, um, instead yeah. of like a, yeah. yeah oh, go ahead, so, so yeah, super interested in this and we're, we're thinking about stuff like this, like, um, but essentially you you can you can handle anything like that in principle, at least, the, the, the challenge is computational. So like uh, you can write down, you know, deformable stuff, you know, uh, soft robots, all this kind of stuff. You, in principle, you can write down a model of that and you can squish it into this kind of form, right? Uh, like a very naive kind of like cartoony way of thinking about this is if I wanted to have like, you know, deformable ground or if I wanted a trampoline say, right? I could model say a trampoline as some like, you know, having some stiffness and damping, like, you know, a bunch of springs, masses, and dampers hooked together, right? And I could just model the physics like this. And then the contact dynamics, you know, the fact that they're touching or not sort of gets handled this way through this interpenetration constraint. And then as soon as they're touching, you get a contact force that's going to, you know, the, you're going to get forces between these things, you'll get deformation. So like, in principle, you can handle all of that. Uh, it's just that if I were to say, you know, try to make a continuum mechanics, you know, like a discretized model, like the trampoline surface that was super accurate, you'd have a lot of degrees of freedom in there and it kind of blow up the size of the problem. So that's, I'd say, the real the real challenge is coming up with like computationally tractable, low dimensional enough models of these things that that you can actually solve fast enough to be reasonable. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you. Great questions. Any other question? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, Zach, this is Joel. Thanks for a, a lovely talk. Um, just a very down in the weeds technical question. So whenever you have these uh, uh, inequality constraints and you try to take derivatives, the derivatives are set valued. You know this, it's a set valued function. Um, and so the way that you handle it is that even when you convert it to the interior point log method, it's still a set valued function, but you use the minimum dissipation principle to choose one of the possible sets of solutions. Uh, but that dissipation principle then depends on choosing some friction coefficient. And, and so I'm not asking a deep technical question, but just intuitively, does the quality of your results then depend a bit upon, you know, uh, your assumptions and estimates about that uh, friction coefficient? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say what we try to do in practice right now, I think you're you're a few steps ahead of where we are currently in, in terms of doing all this. Uh, we've thought a bit about this kind of stuff. But practically speaking, right now, all we're doing is making like conservative inner approximations of these things. So, you know, if we don't want the robot to slip, we just choose mu in the controller to be smaller than we think the real one is, so that we're pretty confident it's not going to generate things that slip. Um, but yeah, hundred percent. I, I think these are these are questions we're really interested in. Actually, um, Shuo, who I mentioned, who's the kind of the estimation guy. Um, is really interested in trying to trying to do a bunch of like online estimation of these sorts of things and learn various bits and pieces of this stack 
from data on the robots to try to dial this stuff in better. Great, thank you. Sure. Uh, so there was a question. Is uh, Andrew from the chat that says, are the impacts completely non-elastic? Yeah, so right now, uh, the way this is set up is completely inelastic collisions. Um, that's not to say that's the only way to do it. That's just, you know, that you could probably do other things if you wanted to. Um, but that's what we're doing right now for basically because it's the easiest thing to do mathematically in this setup. And it seems to be reasonable in terms of like uh, what, what actually goes on on the robots that we're working with. But yeah, that uh, totally, there's, there's lots more to do there as well. Uh, in terms of modeling uh, elastic collisions, uh, more complex friction models for sure. There's a, there's a lot more. Uh, I think we, we're we're always trying to strike a balance between uh, how much physics we model and, and how much compute we can afford. And it's usually the trade usually comes in the side of using the simplest possible models and you know to, to eke out more compute performance. Nice. Any other uh, question? I actually have one, but I want to give the opportunity to others as well. So I'll ask it and maybe somebody else has another then. Um, actually, I was very interested about this notion, the general notion you explained, the fact that you can, given certain properties, you can interconnect the different optimization problems. And I was wondering whether you other than using it to simulate or to find uh, optimal trajectories, depending on what you fix, you can also use these uh, discoveries to, for instance, do system design or um, to, to some extent change the objectives. In particular, when you when you were writing the optimization problems, you, you were talking about find something. Uh, what about comparing something, for instance, if you fix the trajectory you want to follow, but now you want to find the best robot that can that can follow that trajectory. Are, are you thinking about these things or? Yeah, so we are not on this project, but uh, there, there's a bunch of other applications for this sort of general bag of tricks, uh, these sort of differentiable optimization or composable optimization sort of ideas. Um, one is 100%, as you mentioned, doing design optimization. So I have a new PhD student um, who's working in this kind of area. Uh, we have actually, uh, we've started a, a bit of a collaboration with your next speaker in the series, uh, with, uh, Robert Cashman on, on looking at okay, uh, good. <laughs> doing some sort of fish body morphology kind of optimization stuff uh, by basically doing this sort of thing and, and taking the derivatives uh, with respect to not just now the control inputs, but the robot design parameters, kinematic parameters, um, and yeah, trying to trying to dial those in. Uh, the other sort of things I'll mention, I guess there. Uh, so work that we have done, Chuo, who's the uh, sort of guy uh, doing estimation, uh, he's actually got a recent paper that um, does something like what you're saying, where we're we're actually estimating the robots. It's, he's doing sort of the estimation duel of what you're suggesting, where he he estimates the robots' kinematic parameters online. So we have a quadruped. There's always uncertainty and deformation, right? All this kind of stuff. So you estimate all the link lengths and things uh, online, and it turns out this can dramatically reduce your drift if you're trying to do odometry. So it's kind of fun. So we're doing that kind of stuff. And then the last one I'll mention is um, this whole setup, as we were talking about at the beginning, where you kind of hook these problems together is uh, sort of a, in in general, can also handle things like Nash and Stackelberg equilibria from game theory. And we've done a bunch of work like that as well. So yeah, lots of other applications for this set of ideas and optimization tricks. Very cool. Uh, definitely look forward to seeing more, <laughs> more of these results. Uh, let's see, is there any other question from the audience? Okay, it doesn't seem so. I think you you gave your email address in case people realize yeah. later that they had some, some points out. to discuss. Thank you very much again, Zachary, for the great talk. And uh, I wish you good luck for the next steps. And All I right, will follow so up with the video once it's it's been edited. Awesome, thanks for having me. Thank you and thank you everyone for participating. See you all next week for the next talk. Bye.